going to start out with a quiz today, oral quiz. If you can't answer the questions, then we're going to have a written quiz. The way we'll do as far as grading the oral quiz is, if you and this is crucial, this will also help attendance. If your name's on the attendance sheet, and you did the oral quiz, and you, this is like, a little bit like Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember when God came to Abraham and he said, look, find ten good people. I won't blow this, I won't destroy this place. And a lot was like, or Abraham was like, ten? That's an awful lot. <clears throat> So how about five? Okay. Anyway, I think I mentioned the story. I think that eventually he started out at a thousand. But regardless, if two or three of you can, and hopefully more, four or five of you can answer the question, we won't have a written quiz and everybody will get credit. So they're covering your ass. Okay. I'm telling you right now, though, that once we start talking about this book, those of you who haven't picked this up, even if you disagree with what's going on and you think it's fantastical nonsense, you're going to be interested in what this, what this book has to say, who this person was. And on top of that, why more people don't talk about this person and they talk about stupid people like Nostradamus, who's an idiot. Absolute idiot. What's he predicted? And don't tell me Hitler's rise, because he didn't. He said hister. Okay? Anyway, all right. So, who was Edgar Casey? Somebody just tell me that one. And then I'll do a follow-up question. So, who was Edgar Casey? Approximately, when did he live? Patrick. Kentucky in uh, Hopkins. Hopkinsville. Hopkinsville. He was a small town boy. He was a farm. His father until he had his. Guys, please go ahead. And he had a farm. He was a farm boy. And then, like, apparently, when he slept. He got uh, information, and he would just spit it back out. So was that, I think that was in chapter two. Um, so what were, um, first of all, ha he has these special powers. What, what, what were the culmination? In chapter one, they talked about what power did this doctor or this, this guy come to, come to find out whether he had? What power did they, did they suggest that, that Edgar Casey had? It was a big healing power. Guys, one at a time. Go ahead. Um, not in the sense that he laid hands on people. What would he do? Do you remember? Um, Go ahead. Like, uh, would he predict the health coming in the future? Like, if there was what kind of state was he in? Uh, not technically. He'd get into a hypnotic state like that. They used to, they, they call him a sleeping prophet. You actually see him, believe it or not, before this nonsense happened in 2008 with the economy, I remember about six months before the whole thing with Haywire, there were, there were, it reminds me of Men in Black. There was a uh, there was a headline in the National Enquirer that said Edgar Casey predicts Second Great Depression. That's what the Nostradamus people do. Something happened. Look, I'm not interested in you predicting something after it happens. Okay? Where were you on September 10th, Nostradamus? Nowhere to be found. Where were you when you World War II broke out, Joker? That's great. Yeah, that's what I'm talking. I want to I dig him up just to smack him around. <laughs> Put on YouTube. Gary smacks Nostradamus. <laughs> Holds his nose and his corpse stinks. Probably all. I, I, I would say to anybody, I don't care how big you are, eventually you become worm food, Nostradamus. That's where Genghis Khan is. That's where Alexander the Great is. He died when he was 27. Yeah. Alexander the dumbass. That's what they should have called him. <laughs> Burning cities to the ground because someone dared him to. I mean, that's a real nice guy. And we got names for those people now. They're called murderers. I mean, that was the Hitler of his day right there, Alexander. He just didn't project it towards the Jewish people or whatever. And did you give him more time, he would have. Anyway, so Patrick mentioned that he was able to, to sleep on something and do what? What was, what was, was he good at school? No, he wasn't, but he was able to absorb knowledge. What did he do? He would sleep on his textbooks and absorb knowledge. Be able to repeat it the next wait, 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 wait. Say one more time what he used to do? He would sleep on his textbooks and absorb his lectures and be able to repeat it word for word the next step. What? <laughs> and if you weren't just answering my question, I'd put a straight jacket on you. <laughs> or something. Let me tell you something. You go out in public and say stuff like this. Does anybody, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think they talked about this in chapter 2 and chapter 1. How did he gain these powers? I love this. Greg? Or Jeff, sorry. Um, how did he gain these powers? He, I don't know, he was able 
just to put, I, I just read that he was able to put himself in the like. Okay, so I mean, that's how he did it, but. Yeah. Did he saw like an angel? Right. <laughs> he was reading the Bible. Daily vision. Like Tim Tebow. <laughs> okay. Tim Tebow ain't got no power. Though. Wow, he does. He's the power to destroy another football team. The power to scare Mark Sanchez like he craps his pants. <laughs> How's that look in GQ? Mark Sanchez is safe. It's Rex Ryan. It's a little bit. They're all in trouble. I mean, the, the Jets are like a condemned building that people keep trying to like put wallpaper on and make sure they just need to knock the damn thing down. I'd say the same thing about the Mets. Uh, uh, Jets, Nets. <laughs> Same thing, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, at least the Mets have an excuse. They got robbed by one of the world's greatest con artists of all time. Still gonna suck. Anyway, it still doesn't explain why they spend so much money and still choke. Up, up nine games, choke for the... Anyway, but regardless, so he's sitting there reading the Bible, and he had actually read the Bible how many times for every year of his life? He said he read the Bible once. Go ahead. Right, and then by the time he was 18, he'd read it 18 times. And he said that, so, he also said, I don't, I don't know if this is, because I've read, I read this book several times. <laughs> he also claims that had, like, imaginary friends that were really angels and spirits and stuff like that. And he would see, like, relatives of his. Um, and um, how, he, how he claims, or at least the family just explained this, like, the funny thing is, is that when he was able to sleep on the books and spell, You'll see it in chapter 3. His dad was real, at first was freaked out by it, and then was real proud of it. Like, watch what my son can do. He can memorize this if he sleeps. You know, like, and I'll tell you right now, I would just sleep on top of books. I mean, if that was the case. You know what it reminds me of? Remember in The Matrix when they plug Keanu Reeves in that thing, he's learning all the karate and all that? That's what it's like. I would just sleep on karate books. Or something. You know, physics. I'd sleep on a physics book, or like a medical book, and come up with a cure for AIDS, or whatever it is. But anyway, what's interesting, and you'll see throughout his journey, and you can still you can still you can sort of see it here. Was Edgar Casey proud of his um, powers, or was he a little bit concerned that, of what might happen if people found out what he was doing? Like, let me put it another way: Is what Edgar Casey's describing happened, and, and things around him is that normal behavior? So, what are the ramifications if you go around saying you can sleep on books and memorize what's inside them? <laughs> or even just say stuff. Even though forty-one percent of people in this country believe in ESP, if you go to work at IBM and go, "Yeah, I knew what the lottery numbers were," <laughs> or I can talk to your dead aunt, oh, God. <laughs> your dead pet. <laughs> if he really wants to go to the park with you. <laughs> I don't need a pet psychic to know what dogs want. They want food. They want it 24 hours a day. They're like goldfish. If you feed a dog, it will eat until its side explodes. I'm telling you. <laughs> they don't know the word end of appetite or something. Cats, on the other hand, they're pretty smart. That's why you can leave a bowl of food out for a cat. If you do that for a dog, it's gone in five seconds. And then they're chewing on everything else and probably vomiting up a bunch of stuff. Uh, dogs eat plastic. Dogs like food. They eat plastic. Anything. Anyway, regardless. So you have 41% of people who's claiming... They, they believe in ESP, ESP and haunted houses, and the dead people can come back, and, and people can communicate with their minds, and all this stuff. Like, even now, all this weird stuff like witches, 21% of people believe in that. I'm surprised the vampire. Anyway, but if you go out, if you tell your family, you go out in public, you tell your friends that I got psychic powers, you better be able to prove it. Psychics are viewed, psychics and people have psychic power if you just con artists. Like, like magic. Nobody believes someone actually saw somebody in half, do they? I mean, come on. Seriously. You know? But what I find interesting, there are two institutions in this world where not only is this type of, be of, uh, of belief system tolerated, but supported and celebrated. What are the two institutions? One of them should be really clear. Huh? Not mental institutions. <laughs> They're the ones who are putting you away for this. I would say psychiatry is more at war with religion than with sure. science because um, religion supports these types of things where psychiatry looks at, if you're hearing voices, you must be crazy. I got news for you. President Bush went around saying that God talked to him. So here's your, here's your straight jacket. I assure you Obama says the same thing. This is what he said 
They all, they all say this stuff. So religion's one of them, right? So religion's view is that... Is re, here, here, here's where it gets nuanced. Does religion believe that ghosts are real? Or some form of life after death? Yeah. Like angels and stuff. And they believe God is an ethereal being. Do they believe that you can talk to these people? Or that they still exist? Let me put it this way. Do Christians, for the most part, even though Jesus did a lot of these things, Jesus turned water into wine, he walked on water, he quelled a storm, uh, he healed people who were dead and dying, okay? Um, and he predicted that, remember when they were, remember, remember when uh, uh, they were about ready to go to Jerusalem, those of you who know the Bible well, and, and Jesus goes, I'm going to Jerusalem, and Peter goes, or, or Judas actually said this in one of the books, like, yes, you need to go to Jerusalem and show them that you're the Messiah, and Jesus goes, no, 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 no. We're going to get there, and they're going to arrest me and kill me. And then I'm going to rise the third day. And they were like, no. Remember, and Peter comes to him later, and he goes, Jesus, there's got to be some way around this, dude. Come on. I'm like, pay the fine and get out of this. It's like, no, no, this is the way it has to be. So he was even foretelling things. But if you go in church and say that you're like a psychic and you can read people's minds, are they going to accept that? No. But if you are they going to accept that you might be able to heal people? Some of them will. There's churches where they grab people's forehead. No, feel the power of the Lord God. But most people consider that to be a joke, right? It's phony. It's a trick. Right, with the talking in tongues and all that other stuff. There's one other institution, though, that, that, that at least at the very minimum supports the fictional existence of this. What is it? Huh? No, that's a religion, though. Science fiction. Yes, but where does that come out of? The media. The media. Think about Harry Potter and the Twilight and Phenomenon with John Travolta in it. In how many other movies are about psychics? Remember a Powder? Remember that movie Powder? Ghost. Wow. Yeah, Ghost. Yeah, the movie Ghost. I mean, they're on and on and on down the line, right? The, how about how about Darth Vader? He can choke people from across the room. Yeah, but that's because he's got the power. Of but you know what's interesting? God. Let's let's take the movie Phenomenon. Were they trying to suggest that that could be real? <laughs> but they, what they were trying to say on some levels that hey, it could happen. There was actually a case. All right, Alex, go ahead and then I'll finish. Right. <laughs> With movies, though, it's more fictional. People go right, to okay. and say, "Okay, this is fictional." But you're just watching. Turn on the TV, and you've got shows that are like Haunted House, this or Long Island Media, or right. anything based on paranormal. So people who watch these reality TV shows think it's like real. More There's real actually one called Psychic Kids. In fact, like, you find an episode yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. 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 All yeah. Yeah. Name it. These, these kids get haunted by spirits and stuff. Yeah. 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 But again, but again, here, here's what I love. The reason, the reason why it exists in the media is, first of all, you don't sound crazy because you can say it's fiction. Even though you might think it's real. It's a reality. Like TV. Tolkien. I don't think he really thought that was fiction. I, I think he really thought at some point there were elves and things in this world. <laughs> it is the best okay? Or Dune or something like that. Or how about science fiction with aliens? You're telling me that just because we haven't found aliens, that there are no such things as aliens? There's, if, if, there are, if there are human beings on this small planet around this pathetic sun, the, 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 our sun compared to the rest of the suns in the galaxy is pathetic. It is, it is the wimp weakling of stars. It's, it's not impressive, it's not big, it's not hot, but to us it's everything. But to the rest of the universe it's crappy. So if there's life around this planet, you can bet that there's most... Scientists have done the study. Oh, billions, yeah. billions of Carl Sagan once estimated that there are probably at least a million planets in you know a couple galaxies around us that hold intelligent life, that have civilizations in us. So, okay, maybe, and let's take ESP. Maybe the, we haven't proven ESP, but it doesn't mean it's not real. And here, here's the thing. Does the, does, do, do parts of the government accept that ESP might be real and do tests on it? Remember the George Clooney movie? What was it called? Sterico. Uh, like Wasn't that based on reality? Yeah. Yeah. The United States' government has repeatedly tried to, to use what we call remote viewing, where you're sitting in a room and they go, all right, find Bin Laden. And you, you, turn, you close your eyes and you go, okay, he's in it. He's in a room. You can see it. He's looking outside. That kind of stuff. Casey can do that 
he could give a health reading, and also he did past lives, which is another thing. First of all, do, Christ, do, do Christians accept <coughs> reincarnation as reality? No. Do they believe in Atlantis and stuff like that? No. This guy who was a devout Christian said all of that stuff. No, no, no. I don't know who you're talking about there, but he would do all kinds of things. During World War II, he was giving readings for people who were concerned about the safety of their relatives over there. And I'll tell you right now, if my son went to World War II, I wouldn't want no psychic telling me he's going to die two years before. <laughs> Thanks a lot, dude. Look, so now I can buy the gravestone cheap? Thanks for, you know, wrecking that and making me even sicker to my stomach, you know. I'm like, oh, I want you to give me a reading on my, uh, you're, you're pregnant or something. Well, give me a reading on my child. Oh, it's going to die at age four. I would prefer not to know that. It's just like, a, I, I pose this question, and I think it's, it's kind of an interesting mental exercise. If someone was stalking you and was trying to kill you for ten years, and they gave up, would you want to know that or not know that at all? I prefer not to know that. Unless I can kill them. <laughs> Seriously, unless they were arrested for something. Would you really want to know that somebody had been stalking you for ten years? Because what's that going to make you feel like for the rest of your life? That somebody else is doing it too. Just like the wife of the BTK killer. I'm sure she rather would have not known that her husband had killed 11 people and almost got away with it. You know, so anyway. So Casey was doing a lot of those readings. He did do a lot of kids. He actually didn't really want to do kids for a while because he thought, what's the problem? First of all, he thought the gift for, was from the devil or, or had that in him. He thought, like, man, he grew up traditionally Christian, and traditional Christ Christians do not believe in Atlantis and Lemuria and, like, in, in weird creatures and, and, and odd stuff like that, and that you can get inside. This is what Casey said. He did, they did a reading on why he could do the readings, and it said that he was able to tap into what was called the Akashic Records. Or, or also the Book of Life, which is like a, think about it this way. There is a database somewhere in the universe, like a cloud thing, <laughs> like cloud computing, where every single thing that's ever been done or said in reality is imprinted, like a movie. Like you can go in there and be like, okay, I want to see what happened during the War of 1812. And you plug in the tape and you can read where everybody's standing. Not what, not what some historian said happened, but what actually happened. What words did Hitler speak when he was alone with Abraham Braun? Those types of stuff. You can determine that stuff. And just like that, he was discovering cures for diseases like lupus. They have, still have not cured lupus. Okay? I used them as remedies. I used to get cold sores on my mouth. This is stuff called atomic iodine. You put it on there, it like that. Like that! Okay? Atomic, atomic <laughs> iodine. It's actually electrified iodine. Okay? It's really good. You can use it for all kinds of things. You can cancer sores in your mouth or cuts. It's cleans your uh, stuff out. All that kind of stuff. And he would always say surgery is the absolute last, last um, uh, resort that people should go to. And to show you that, first of all, he only had an eighth grade education. He was very ambivalent about this power, so he was very afraid that he might hurt somebody. And I'll tell you right now, even though medicine was not well codified back then, to, to have known that you killed somebody because you gave him the wrong ingredients or something, you know, you can be tried for murder. So this wasn't a game to some extent. Uh, and, and one of the things that he focused on was like herbal medicine and holistic medicine and talking about the energies of the body. He really, this really is the father of holistic medicine. Okay? But it just got weird for him because I think that he didn't want to be a freak show. He really wanted a normal life and this was the road to being a freak and everybody kept trying to trying out and testing and he had no knowledge of anatomy. And the proof that it wasn't a joke was, get this, there was a young woman who had a, a, like an obstruction in her, uh, right around here. And they opened her up several times and didn't find anything. They were absolutely at their, law, the, their, their wits end. They had Edgar Casey do a reading and he found a clear button right there that the x-rays or whatever primitive x-rays they had couldn't pick up. Okay. Also, he was a door-to-door -door salesman. And he lost his voice. And what happens when you're a door door salesman and you lose your voice? It's over. It's over. Okay? And also, similarly, his son burned his eyes. You'll see this. He burned his eyes real bad. He was a, 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 a photographer. And back then, in order to get a flash, you'd have this combustible powder. And the kid lit it on fire, and the doctor said he'd never see again. And in every case, he did a reading, and they had these poultices, like this stuff with like, plant, like apricot plants and stuff on his eyes, and it worked. 
when he when he lost his voice though, they had him lay down on on um, the table, and they this Dr. Ketchum guy put him in a hypnotic state, and they asked him what. We have this body, Edgar Casey here, what's wrong with it? And he said, oh, he's got the strain of a muscle. They said that while he was laying there, this red flush of blood came into his throat and then went back down, and then all of a sudden when he woke up, he could talk perfectly. And medical science still has not explored any of this stuff. They haven't examined atomic iodine. You think they'd want to? But let me put it this way. If you're Pfizer or Herc, do you want some simple product like baking soda to get in the way of one of your stupid drugs? Do you want people, instead of taking Lipitor, to take bilberry root and garlic? I don't think so. Garlic, garlic pills cost about $20 for about like 200 of them. Lipitor costs about $6 a pill. Okay? And I, uh, um, if I had it, uh, you can actually get Edgar Casey's reading on a CD that he did for everybody, and it lists all the diseases that he talked about. And he talked about cancer and all kinds of stuff. And, I assure you, if he was around, he could find the cures for Crohn's disease. I would love if Edgar Casey was around to do a reading on HIV. Is there a solution to this? I, my only fear is that if we ever cured HIV, it would be a new sexual uh, revolution, and then when another disease would come up. Okay? Just like, like syphilis. Syphilis was the AIDS of its day. If you got syphilis, you had a... At least AIDS killed you quick, for the most part. Syphilis, like, dragged on like a real bad movie that never stopped. Hitler supposedly had it. Benjamin Franklin had it. So what? Whatever. Syphilis. It's very easy to cure. It is now when we got penicillin. What I love about penicillin, they found some moron. Like, first of all, never eat in a laboratory. I don't know what the hell it was about. I don't care if you, you ruin the next great thing. Why are you eating a sandwich in a laboratory? Just like the guy who invented acid. Why are you licking your fingers or whatever the hell happened there, buddy? You don't, oops, I accidentally ingested acid. I don't think so. He, and that guy freaked out when he was, he was riding his bike home. <laughs> Everything started melting. He lost his mind. <laughs> he called the ambulance and the 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 the, the guy the, the the people who came with the ambulance said there's nothing wrong with this guy. And he's like, yeah, there's something wrong. <laughs> anyway, but again, you know, I would love to see Edgar Casey nowadays with all these new diseases we have. You know, we're dealing with things like lupus or cancer. He did say cancer was one of the hardest things to to cure, but it was no simple cure for for cancer. Uh, and he also suggested that cancer also had to do with people's past lives. That something they did in their past lives will cause their cancer. There's a controversial element. This is why people don't, especially Christians, don't like to talk about reincarnation. Because what reincarnation suggests, if you were born in this life without a leg, you deserved it. You did something in your past life to deserve it. And also what it suggests, if you were beautiful and wealthy in this life, you must have done something right in the other one. But here's the thing. What if being Paris Hilton is a curse? And it probably is. No one takes you seriously. I mean, other than her money, I want nothing that woman did. Well, almost nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do another take. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. So regardless, so, so here's the element of, so what is a stigma and what does it have to do with believing in psychics or being a psychic? What, what do you think is more, what is a stigma and then what do you think is more stigmatized? Being a psychic or believing in psychics? What is the stigma to start with? Jeff? It's uh, kind of like a stereotype. Well, to some extent. You might want to think, you know, like uh, like this. It's a negative view. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, what it is is sort of a black, like a, like a mark, like a, like a red X on your back. Uh, you know, you, uh, like, like um, I'm trying to, like, like Terrell Owens. He has a, you guys know who this is. He has a stigma that he's a... I mean, um, Skip Bayless calls him a team obliterator. Um, he's got a stigma attached to him. Ron Artest has got a stigma attached to him. Um, world peace. Huh? World 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 peace. World yeah. world peace. Did he actually change it like yeah. Chad yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to think of some other. Richard Nixon's got a stigma attached to him. Hitler. Yeah, Conseco, perfect example. Even though he was dead right about every single thing he said, people just don't like it. Okay, you want to talk about Rafael Palmeiro's got a bigger stigma. I, I did not do this. <laughs> anyway, somebody should have bit his finger off. Anyway, so Rafael Palmeiro whacked his finger in front of Congress and said, I did not use steroids, and then two months later he tests positive for steroids. And like three other hormones. Yeah, a loser. 
I mean, what kind of an idiot does that? It's like, I'm not on coke. Well, you just test positive for coke. Martina Hingis. Anyway. So a stigma is sort of a black mark. It is a mark that is placed upon you by the majority of people in society or by your social group. Like if you're somebody and you go out in a bar and you, and you keep burping or farting, you're going to have a lot of friends. You're going to get the stigma that you are, you are the stick ball. I mean, you are the one. I mean, like, look, and you'll, and they'll, they'll give you a nickname. You know, sticky pants something, you know. Or bad, you know, if you have bad, you call you dragon breath. Right? You'll get a stigma. So stigmas can be based on things like physical deformities or some kind of strange thing. Like up until now, like why do you think they call people handicapped instead of crippled? Well, right? Or like they don't call people retarded anymore, do they? Because that's a stigma, right? Right, right. Or even, you know, even, even words like even calling somebody black or negro, right? But this is a bad thing, okay? But these have, the words have power to them. And when you call somebody a weirdo or a degenerate or a dork or a communist or whatever the hell or a terrorist, these things have meaning to them. And it usually means that there are ramifications. If you go around telling people that you believe in psychics or that you are a psychic, that you tell people you are a psychic, you better be able to prove it. Okay? If you tell people you believe in psychics, people will potentially not talk to you. They might, you know, they will exclude you from things. You might lose your job over something like this. All right, if you're trying to get a job, I suggest not putting a thing on YouTube why you believe in ghosts. It's probably not going to help your chances. Although, if you apply for a job at Google, I think they might not, they might think that's cool. You know, if you go to IBM, they'd be like, no, you, know, you don't believe in psychics, do you? I mean, they're not going to ask you these questions, but if it comes out, it's going to, like you're in the lunchroom, and you're like, yeah, I believe in psychics. My aunt's a psychic. They'd be like, at first, maybe it might not be that big of a deal. But it'll get around real quick, won't it? Like, man, what Pop said at lunch. Hey, but I said he believed in leprechauns. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Like, seriously, you think about that. EFP is one thing. If you say you believe in unicorns, man, come on, right? What kind of things are people going to label you as? Idiot. Stupid is one of them. What else? Immature. Immature. Like, kids believe in that. What else? Huh? So crazy is probably the number one thing they're going to think of you, right? Yeah. But you, or you're just twisted in the head, right? I mean, you just, you're, 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 you, dr drugs messed up your brain, uh, and that's the way it is. Yes. I think that it's two different things if you, for, for one thing to say that you are a psychic, and it's another thing to say that you All right, what do you think's worse? I think that it's, it's not necessarily... Worse. I mean, if you say you are a psychic, then people say, oh, you know, you're just a fraud trying to make a buck. Well, if you say you're a psychic and you can't perform any, even a card yeah. trick, you got problems right there yeah. anyway. But but in general, do you think it's more of a... So most people don't say that they're psychics, do yeah. they? So the more prevalent reality is that people will say they believe in psychics. Yeah. Now, many times what, what you'll do to prevent a stigma... We're, in, in the next class, we're going to talk more about what a stigma is and, 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 and lay this down. It's one thing to say... What, what people normally do, because you see here, what do these 41% of people do, right? You know, I'm not going to ask people what they believe in. But I assure you, most of you believe in one of these things. Okay? And, and what, 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 what most people say, like, hey, I don't know, maybe ghosts are real. That's what they'll say, right? Hey, I've seen some weird things. Like, I, I've had this happen. Maybe I mentioned this to you. You ever, you ever were going to call somebody on the phone and you picked up the phone and it didn't ring and they were right on the other end? Yeah. That's a weird one, isn't it? Explain that to me. I mean, you pick it up, it's like, hello? And the other person's like, hello? It's like, it's the weirdest crap. I have this psychic thing with Simpsons episodes. I'll think about scenes, and then the rerun will be on that day at 7.30. It's really strange. You're in the Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> but does that make me crazy? No, maybe, I, maybe it's just, look, somebody, a rational person would go, look, they run Simpsons reruns all the time. I've seen every single one of them. You're just like, it could have made up anything, you know? It's not like I predicted the score of the Mets game or something, you know, exactly. That's easy. Yeah, zero to show on the other side of the channel that, that explores a lot of this stuff, actually. The sci-fi channel? Yeah, like the science channel, like through the wormhole with Morgan Freeman, they talk about yeah. 
ESP and a global kind Well, also, of also science gets involved in this. I mean, I didn't have this article for you, but I, I'll put it up online if people are interested in it. They did thing, the thing called the Gansfield experiments. Anybody ever seen Ghostbusters? Yeah. Remember at the very beginning where he's going, he had to, and he was trying to hit on the girl. With the uh, cars. Right, with the squiggly lines. Uh, and the one guy got it right, but he was still shocking them. And that girl got it wrong every time. And he's just like, that's exactly right. And then, and then he was like, oh, I'd like to continue this experiment. And she goes, say 7 o'clock. He's like, you just read my mind. <laughs> 7 o'clock? Like that, right? Like they did these card things, and they said that 55% of the time they found that people were able to guess these things. Here's the thing, though. A rational person would, dis would, would, would uh, uh, define that what way. But they would explain that what way? Coincidence. Or guessing. Hey, you know, look. Like, there's only so many combinations. It's like poker. A great player, poker player, psychics. No, they just they watch the cards. They see what comes up. It's like a blackjack player. Like with Rain Man. Was he psychic? He was just counting the cards. This this is actually possible, especially at these casinos that only use six decks. It's frowned. Frown <laughs> upon. You know what I frown upon? Stacking the deck so I end up with nothing. That's what I frown upon. <laughs> they, they were saying that they were saying that it's actually like really possible that you could have a a, a, a little bit of an extra sense. They said that that's uh, what they're thinking. Like the if sixth. you look at if you look at uh, birds that are flying the way that they always fly in perfect formation and everything, they say that that might be. Like a almost, lateral line, like fish. Like an extra sensory thing that they're all in. The well, here's the thing as well. People, rational people who, who are on the border of science and, and, and what we call metaphysics will tell you, look, I have a deep emotional connection to my mom. Why can't I be able to project things through my mind to her? Or, or if someone died and I was like ghost. Why did he come? Why did Patrick Swayze come? Now he really is a ghost. But why did he come back? I, I love Patrick, so I hurt when he died with pancreatic cancer. He died like he died within weeks. Yes. Oh, I was gonna say when you said about the phone thing, did you ever be on the phone with someone and you hear another conversation on the phone line? No, that sounds more like the FBI is probably listening. No, to it's like you can hear people. You can hear someone else's conversation. No yeah, but did it come to your mind? That's, that's, that's weird. Right? I don't know about that's psychic anyway. <laughs> what about like the they talk about like real wing connection? What what connection? Oh, the twin connection. Yeah, yeah. There's a good example. Twins claim that like when one of them gets hurt, the other one can feel it from like a, a thousand miles away. Explain that type of crap. I mean, yeah, they work. Yes, and they know when one of them in trouble. Like when I heard twins say this: when something bad happens to my other twin, it makes me feel like nauseous. Like I can feel it emotionally. So there's something going on there. So maybe it's not just metaphysics, not just a spirit. Maybe there are physics. Physical bonds. That was the idea of Ghostbusters. That ghosts are physical and that I can create a laser grid and hold them in this thing. That was the idea. And I'll tell you right now, like things like Jurassic Park and like Ghostbusters, that's not too far from scientific reality. You think they couldn't catch a ghost and hold it? You know? And spiritual things have energy to them. Energy is weight, energy is matter. Just like the sun, right? The beams coming off of it, that's you can if you could grab that and weigh it, it would weigh. Yes. I was just going to um, add on to the physical. Um, I have a friend that her mother has the same connection as her. So if she gets hurt, her mother gets hurt and she gets sick just like And there are some psychics that we call empaths that when, in, 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 like, Casey was an empath um, and he was able to sort of jump into people's body while he was asleep and it protected him from getting sick. Some empaths, when somebody sick comes in the room, they start to feel the symptoms immediately. If they've got a headache or something, the, the empath gets a headache. It's quite a uh, it's quite a frightening reality. Um, not to sound crazy, but I'm telling you right now that uh, 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 some people some people can just look at someone's face. I can sort of I, I would say most people have this power. Like for the longest time, I was able to, I was I always left parties right before they got busted, and like this weird feeling would come up my back. Okay, stuff like that, and I can. And I, I would say I would say here's another example of like very pretty pervasive pretty pervasive like. Maybe not psychic ability, but beyond just physical ability, you can tell when somebody's upset. Even if they're hiding it. And the more you know, the more you can. So maybe these aren't too far from reality. Maybe what some people suggest these are just abilities we have forgotten. And that's what Casey said about Atlantis. And, but once you start getting into Atlantis and reincarnation, it's like, what? Like, this, this shows you how far Casey's views went that go deviant. We'll talk about this. Um, Casey said that Jesus was Adam. And that the reason why he got hung on a cross is because he committed the first sin in the Garden of Eden. And that 
Get, get this. And that Mary was Eve. And she had to bear Jesus so he could suffer. And so she could suffer and watch her son die. Because they made the mistake in the Garden of Eden. Are you kidding me? You walk into any... I don't care if it's a sci-fi channel or a group of spiritual people. You say something like that, man. They put the cuckoo thing on your head. Like, here's the dunce cap in the straight jacket. And here's some Thorazine. And, and, oh, <laughs> and keep your morning open tomorrow because we're going to perform a lobotomy on you. Okay? Seriously. You, and I'll tell you what. You, you're not going to make any friends in the Christian church by saying that Adam was Jesus. Okay? I mean, that's some... And, 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 and supposedly Casey said that Jesus was repeatedly reincarnated. And at one point he helped to build the pyramids. I'm telling you, if you read this stuff, it's crazy. Can you understand why Edgar Casey didn't want people to know what the hell he was doing in the 1890s? I mean, that sounds crazy now. Imagine what that sounded like then. And supposedly, the reading said that Edgar Casey partly generated this power to be able to read people's bodies because at one point... And like a thousand or so years ago, he was dying on the battlefield for three days. And he was able to teach his mind to remove himself from the pain. And that yeah. he was rewarded with that. You see how weird this is getting? See, this isn't some guy getting into hypnosis telling somebody to take coriander or, or, or some root or something like that. This is weird. This, this, question, this calls into question anthropology and evolution and religion and everything that you based your reality on. Edgar Casey picked it up and threw it around. I mean, threw it around. He lifted up the roots and threw it around. But so, so that's the book, and I'm glad everybody's reading. I think this book is giving you guys sort of a, a lot of help. This is an interesting book. I do want to tell you though that um, Thomas so grew to, to give you an idea of why this is so detailed, because you might want to know how the hell did he hear all these conversations. He interviewed uh, Casey's wife and Casey and a lot of his friends, and he was, Thomas lived at the time when Casey did so. He actually died in 1944, I think. Somewhere in there. So he knew Edgar Casey very well. So this is pretty much, it's biographical. There's probably things that didn't happen exactly the way he presents it. But it is pretty accurate. But to highlight this point, so look, even with 41% believe in ESP, which is, which is really what we're talking about with Edgar Casey, also the clairvoyant, there's still 59% who don't. And you can bet the 59% includes government officials and heads of religions, or at least some heads of religions, and heads of corporations. But if you're going to be the head of a corporation or run a government, you cannot, in the United States, in the rational world, you cannot go around saying this stuff. Did you imagine it? I mean, President, President Obama doesn't want people to know he's smoking. Did you imagine if he came out and said, yeah, you know what, I talked to my dead father last night. Because his dad's dead. And I talked to Elvis, too. Or, or worse, Elvis said we should cut the budget deficit. <laughs> <laughs> or, or George Bush at one point. George Bush at one point didn't. He said he talked to God. Why do we throw him out of the to listen to Because Satan? most of these most most people who are Christians say that stuff. No. The Pope says that. Okay? Well, I don't know if it's a matter of whether you talk to God, it's a matter of whether God, God talks to you. Right. Well, a lot of them say that. And and, and one of the classic <laughs> definitions of being psychotic yeah. is hearing voices. And yeah, and talking back to the and I'll tell you right now, I don't think out of the 7 billion people on this earth, there's not a single one that hasn't heard some voice in their head. Well, Even if this is, yeah, they're your own. Sometimes I get bored and I run like TV shows in my head. I think we all do that. Yeah, that's what I love about TV. Eventually they're just going to hit. You're going to have a little satellite receiver on your temple, and it'll go right into your brain, and you just close your eyes. And then it'll be truly 3D television. <laughs> Anyway, yes, one last thing, Alex, then we'll move on. Uh, I was going to say something, maybe you touched on it. All right. So, again, I, I, is there agreement here that uh, believing in psychics and being a psychic is somewhat deviant, can lead to stigma? Who here believes that to be true? Okay. I'm going to hear thinking it's not, it's not that bad. I mean, there's no problem with it at all. So, at least most people have somewhat of saying it's a problem. Here is a man, I'm going to show you this, from Glen Cove. His name is John Edwards, not the senator who cheated on his wife when she was dying of cancer. That guy's in hell now. Or will be. This is John Edwards, the psychic. He is a psychic medium. There's actually two psychics on Long Island that are pretty well known. There's a woman who seems to care much about her hair and her nails. as She has a little power. Her family doesn't like... What? She's like, my hand, my nails, and my... Yeah. 
It's probably weirding people out. Anyway, the difference is, I can almost guarantee you, this woman believed in psychics from the time she was young. John Edwards, on the other hand, his dad was an NYPD cop. Do you think an NYPD cop is going to believe that you can talk to dead people? Or something. And I'll tell you right now, do you think, even if he did believe this, or at least accepted his son, do you, do you think he wants the other police officers to know that his son's talking to dead people? The government does not recognize psychics. Regardless of what the FBI and the CIA does behind the scenes, the government does not accept that. And the quickest way to lose the presidency is to go out and say that you can talk to people in your mind and stuff like that, or move rocks and stuff. Okay? Oh, by the way, Edgar Casey claimed that the pyramid was built by using mental powers. They moved the blocks with their mind. The force. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like Darth Vader. So he was choking people instead of helping people. He might have been helping people. Anyway, so here's John Edwards, and he is describing, uh, for some reason, I guess it's appropriate, he's on, William Shatner had this show called Raw Nerve, and I love William Shatner because we talk about somebody who's self-deprecating and still, I don't know how you can be arrogant and self-deprecating at the same time, but that's Conan O'Brien, too. So, but anyway, William Shatner, who probably believes in psychics since he was Captain Kirk on uh, Star Trek, and he was, uh, wasn't he, uh, was he T.J. Hooker? Yeah, and, 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 and he does Priceline, the no, way he used to. Anyway, so he interviewed John Edwards, and John Edwards is describing his journey from not believing in psychics to being one. It's one thing to go from not believing in psychics to believing in psychics to sort of believing in psychics. This one went from thinking psychics were the dumbest thing in the world to becoming one. How do you go from that? <laughs> That's like being a Democrat all your life, and all of a sudden now you're a Christian conservative or something. Okay, so part of it is successful. But here, let's look at, listen to what he says about how his family and friends viewed this. So I think this is interesting. This is about a 20 minute video, about 14 minutes. And then we'll talk about, we'll talk about other people who believed in psychics and astrology. Ronald Reagan? No, it was his wife, Oh, I was going to say, what a disappointment that would be. Dale Earnhardt claims that his father's ghost pulled him out of a car when he was in California when it caught on fire. I'll show you that too. But when you're Dale Earnhardt, you can say stupid stuff like, or seemingly stupid stuff like that. When you're mean, you say that. Yeah, you just pretty much guaranteed your next Friday, next couple hundred Friday and Saturday nights are going to be by yourself. Because none of your friends, mama, there's probably some women who believe in psychics. No, anyway, I don't believe you. <laughs> and most of my friends don't want to listen to it either. I talk about, I start to talk about Edgar Casey and roll their eyes. Like, come on, man. You know? <laughs> Come on. I mean, like this. Yeah. This is this is silly. And the stuff about walking on water and uh, uh, you know eating flesh and drinking blood, that's perfectly normal. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing odd about thinking that the Garden of Eden was real and that Noah really built an ark and put every animal on it. Okay. Flanders version, he put every animal was the same sex because he didn't want any hanky-panky going on. <laughs> but aren't you just encouraging it the wrong the other way? So anyway. All right, so here's this video of John Edwards talking to William Shatner about his experience as a psychic. And any, any doubt any short men have about the fact that you think you can't have confidence, just look at William Shatner. He's five foot two. Okay, he's one of the most confident people I've ever seen. Is he really five foot two? No. Edward has no, an unusual think. ability to talk to those who have passed and to suggest Maybe what five, one. might lie in a person's future. What he couldn't So this guy does show that it's two hundred dollars today. He did one at Old Westbury just a little while. Is wrong. And again, how does a conversation happen? How does a a form of well you could call it a form of entertainment what you do at the same time? Whether it's a conversation between one person here in the physical world or a conversation between somebody who's out of the physical world, you know, called the other side, heaven, whatever you want to call it, we're still, doing, we're still talking about energy. So it's really an energetic conversation that's taking place. When somebody goes to a concert, a, a person sings, that person sings, the music plays, that vibrational frequency is transmitted across to anybody that's in that room to be able to experience that music, and that makes them feel, that makes them react, that makes them sing along, that makes them identify. That's what takes place. When you're doing what I'm doing, I'm basically doing the same thing. I'm not singing, I'm not playing music, 
I'm emitting a frequency, and I'm capturing that frequency of a conversation. And it's the vibration of the love between the people who are in the living and the people who are on the other side, oh. and making that connection. And then trying to get people to raise their awareness, not that they need the medium, but that they can recognize this conversation as it happens in their everyday lives. And it's funny, when my grandmother was alive, she used to say to me all the time, because she would hear me say to my clients, you don't need me, you know, you don't have to come see me to understand this. I hope I did my job well enough to be able to validate for you that you're... Yeah, is your, your grandmother alive or dead? Or dead? Do we say past instead of dead? Is that a better yeah. phrase? Okay. There's only one, uh, there's only, one, uh, only one word that I dislike more than dead. Is expired. Okay. I thought the bill. A carton of milk. This <laughs> might be the other one. Expired. I used to work in healthcare, and he used to irritate me when you know. You Edward feels the way I do. Some extent. This you know, is the, the world actual, where people uh, die, and the afterlife people don't die. Expired. You don't get cancer. Expires. People do not. Like that to me, like irritates me. This is the wrong um, death. I, I don't use the word um, dead or die because I don't see it as being death. I don't see it as being final, like your end. I see it as being a transition. So to me, crossing over like transition, cookie. pass on. You were in healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, five but, years. Five years. That's what my background was. That's what I wanted to like run, run a hospital. Run a hospital. So in the in the process of getting my degree, I wound up so somebody working was trained in hospital. rational science and science phlebotomist, which meant that mm -hmm. I was the person who you know, tapped on you at six o'clock in the morning saying, "Give me your arm. I need to draw your blood." So well, that's what I did for what's a What's the call there? Yeah. What called me to that was the opportunity to get involved with a hands-on aspect of healthcare. They would actually train you. And my mom had passed in 1989. She had lung cancer. And I had gotten very involved with helping to take care of her. My cousin Roseanne <coughs> was like her nurse. And it was taken notice by one of her neighbors, like how amazing she was in taking care of my own mom, um, her aunt. And she said, you know, the hospital is hiring some, some people to be trained in the healthcare field. You're at uh, what age at this point? I was 19. So my cousin wasn't doing it, and then she, maybe three months after that, she brought me on, and I was trained on, in the hospital and actually had trouble. What I'm trying to get to is what your interests were before. What you do is so fundamental, life and death. Mm -hmm. and Did you hear William going, come on, you're crazy, right? Half of that. You're an idiot. And it's not even a half because there's life and then there's nothing, or something. He's but, not even questioning well, this is real. There's life and then there's life. Right. From a personal point of view, <laughs> I, I, I want to believe Satin's it. like, can you, can you know I don't know us? how you deal with what you do day to day. It's so onerous. Everybody's coming to you. Say, John, help me. Help me, John. I got it. My, my father, my mother, my loved one. My aunt. And you, you're inundated. How do you escape that? How do you, how do you, you know, get away from people like me saying, John, I want to talk to somebody's back? I think it's normal. And I think you, I don't think I personally have a right to even go to that place. Um, I think it's it would be, you know, I, I, I made a decision when I did this work publicly, when I decided, decided to write a book, go on the radio, be on television to, to do this, and which is always for me is to raise awareness and teach. When I made that decision to do that, yeah. I feel like, you know, I joked around my family and said, look, I'm going to a big old bill, you know, bullseye on my ass now, and, and people are going to be taking pot shots left and right. I go, I cannot care about what you're going to say. I have to just understand that this is what my goal is, and that is I'm to like teach. Casey, who is and with that, it becomes the opportunity fun. for a different audience. So I, I, I've kind of like looked at things in that capacity, but I also recognize that because of what I do, and because of creating an interest in it, I'm going to start a dialogue. And you know what? Yes, there are questions that I've heard over and over and over that I've answered over and over but it might be the first time that you're asking me the question. And you have a right from from where you're sitting to ask that question and get <coughs> an honest and fresh answer from me. You're and that's kind of like how my approach is always. Whether because trust me, I'm gonna be in the you're same room tonight. Paint. And I'm gonna be in the same room again tomorrow night. And I'm gonna be in the, really the same question. I'm gonna get the same question. Yeah. Uh, what's it like to be Captain Kirk? I mean, how many times have I heard that? <laughs> but has the thought that you oh, may be like wrong and, and, and that you're that you're uh, psychotic and not psychic. <laughs> I've actually heard that too. Um, you know, not psychotic, but then again, somebody who was psychotic wouldn't be thinking that they're psychotic. But um, no, but out of touch with reality. Has the thought occurred to you that that maybe what what you're doing is only like in my head? In your head, yes. No, and I'll tell you why. Um, my background, as we talked about earlier, is you know in healthcare. So I have a clinical analytical mindset. Yes, that's number one. My mom's side of the family, very open to anything psychic related. That was the, like, they loved this right subject matter. My father was a New York City police officer and yeah. a military guy. It was like, this is not real. 
So you put the two together, you, 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 get, get? My, you get me. Well, wait a minute. You get me. You get you with those two systems? Those two, exactly, those two things. So when I approach this, um, the backstory for me is at 15, a psychic was coming to my grandmother's house to do readings, and I was the person who was doing the whole Twilight Zone music, debunking her, making fun of my family, going, okay, here's the deal. You're going to go up there, and she's going to assess who you are, and she's going to tell you based upon blah, blah, blah. This guy was so making this was, fun of science. My mom was like, please be respectful. She goes, even if you don't believe, please, I've taught you to be respectful of other people's experiences and beliefs. So long story short, I sat with her. Now he's probably the most well-known well psychic in the entire world. There. And you actually hold on to it. Yeah. Everything, every object has a frequency or vibration. Mm -hmm. And she did psychometry. Did not look at me. Did not. She just held it and looked straight down. Did never, never even really dealt with me. And she basically said, I'm here today to put you on the path that you're supposed to be on. Now, if there was a camera in the room, you, you would have watched me like look at this woman and then like, like do like one of these like, okay. What does that look mean? Like, is, like, is she crazy? Yeah, okay. Like, are they, so I was like, all right, now I just got my be respectful of other people's beliefs and right. feeling speech from well, most people would rather be and this woman was accused someone, of you know, like friendly with a mom, minor so crime than like, be know, called I crazy. Want to, I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble when this was over for being disrespectful. So I sat there and I just listened, and she went on to tell me about how I had these highly evolved energies that were around me, and that she was there that day to put me on my path that I was going to change the way millions of people thought about psychic phenomena and 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 death. Like, all right, like, no unemployment line for me? Now, here's what I'm thinking. If you're really psychic, wouldn't you know that I don't believe in this? And would you not just say, look, I can't do this, and then not give me anything to work with? Instead, she went down the most ridiculous path for me. And I, like, looked at this woman, and I was like, I really, I, okay, you know. And then there were other things, family-wise, that made sense at that time. There were things... Made sense in what matter? Well, she was accurate. Like, she oh, was I accurate with what she said. But now, in my mind, I'm like, well, I was probably, like, maybe nine or ten out of the people that she had read that day. She read people before me. She clearly knew I was my mother's son. So, in my mind, she could have been pulling from the other people. And then... So, like, this is how my analytical, skeptical mind was working within the spirits. But there were things that she came out with that are not important. But for me, at that time... There is absolutely no way this woman would have known unless I told her ahead of time or she was with me when these events took place. What was your relationship with your dad? Uh, non-existent. 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 Ever come to Not really. Not, not really. And there wasn't a lot of, you know, touching. There wasn't a lot of emotional. There wasn't a lot of, I love you. It's like, I, the best way to give an example is my mom's side of the family was like, yeah. This. Come eat. Yeah. You know, even, Come eat. You know, even if it was like, you know, yelling and whatever, and yeah. loud and fun and parties. You and can I'm bet that his mom like probably that. still lives very up there. Distant and disconnected. And, you know, I'm very happy to say that I've been able to forge a relationship that's with that's his brother, that's which is really that's that's exciting. Right. My uncle, which is a very exciting He's thing. He's um, Because he gets a chance to be part of my kids. So they get, they, my dad's passed, so I, they don't. I think they actually don't they're both both parents. Right. So they get a chance to. My dad's passed as well. Both parents have passed. Right. I read about your contact with your mother. Have you ever contacted your father? You know, the interesting thing about the contact with my father is that as close as I was to my mother, I actually can say I feel closer to my father now that he's passed. Why? Because I don't think he's playing a role anymore. That he's yeah, because you wanted here. that. You know, You're imagining get, this. Um, in their Freak. Lives, they get stuck <laughs> in the role of who they are. And I think that when he, when he made his transition, I think he was able to look back on things and say, you know what, maybe I could have done that differently. The question is, is like, Hitler burning? You know, and he might have had a very, very deep conversation we'll talk before to Hitler. He, he left. Okay. Because if he's in heaven, it's all a big sham. Uh, mm. He was really? in Florida. Was talk about the removal. Yeah, he was on the phone. And, and we had a conversation that was very, very specific. Was he dying? He was not dying at the time. But it was, it was me making a decision to remove myself energy-wise, because I didn't want to do the conflict. I didn't want to have the... How old were you? I was... 21? You were 20, 21. You're 21, and your dad's in Florida, you're in uh, New York, New York. Yeah. and you, you call him? He called me. I said to him, I said, look, you, you and I are you and I are not going to have the father son thing. I go, so why don't we strive to be friends? I said, let's try to find a balance. Let's try to, you know, don't come at me like I'm six. Don't tell me, like, be careful that I'm going to put my hands here and get burned. You know, I'm already beyond that. I go, we've already done this. I go, so let's try to forge a relationship where we can have communication and a conversation and we can share. Let's, let's do that. And um, 
I don't need you to be in that other role. I go, because I'm already passed out of my life. I said, and, you know, yes, I would have liked to have had a dad and a relationship like that. But you know what? We don't have that opportunity. And, I, and at that time, his sister had, had, a, had a child. They said, here's what I think you should do. I think that you should give all your love, attention, anything like that to your nephew. Be the best uncle you can possibly be. I said, and work off some of the stuff that maybe he didn't have the opportunity to work off with me. I go, I will work that off when I'm a dad. I said, so what I didn't get from, from you, from a dad, I said, I know that when I become a dad, that's going to be something that I'll work on. That must have been terribly emotional for him. It's, a, it's like the sons. I wouldn't say emotional. I would say uh, the exact words were, maybe I should have taken you away from your mother when I had a chance, was the exact words. Wow. And I was like, this has nothing to do with my mom. This has to do with energy. It has to do with recognizing lessons and, and you know the work that I do. Yeah, but John. There's also something underlying that the father-son relationship thing, that he sounded like he wanted, that you must, every child wants. Oh, so absolutely. But I, I, I made a decision, and I, I'm very, very clear, and I take full responsibility for it for, from him and for everybody. I made a decision to disconnect myself from that. What age was that when you didn't make that decision? Oh, well, I made it multiple times, but the time that I made it like stick was probably like 1982, 1983, when he chose not to come to my wedding. Did he said, I'm not coming to your wedding? No, he never responded. You sent him an invitation? Sure. Did you call him and say, Dad, you coming? No. You ever use the word Dad? Oh, that's a phenomenal question. Um, I'm sure I did as a child. But not later. You called him by name? No, I referred to him by title. Which is Chief or? Captain Jack. Captain Jack. Never dead. Jack Sparrow. No. No warm. No. Pop. Ah. No. No. Emotionally, he, he was. It was tough. He was very, very, you know, definitely he had, he, he, he had an alcohol background, so there was, there was definitely an issue that was yeah. there that got, got worse over, over a period of time. And it resulted in his death? Um, I, I would assume that it, it contributed. I don't know. I mean, he had cancer, so. I don't know how you do that. How do you. How do you escape this burden? Because I don't see it as being a burden. I see it as being such an amazing opportunity. You know, I was there when my mom passed. Um, I was 19. And to watch somebody at 48 die from lung cancer, and it was a very, very intense disease. And she had developed tumors all over her body, and they had opened up. It was a very, very hard thing to watch and witness. And Open sores of the It was very, very tough to watch. And to know that this was coming, and to, to kind of to be present in the moment. Were you there the whole time? I was there the whole time. I was there the, I was there the entire time and, you know, all the treatments and all the stuff. And, you know, the hard stuff for me, you know, we talked a lot about my dad and my relationship, but if you want to know the honest He's only 40 truth, something years old, both his parents are dead. That I think I ever had to deal with was not seeing my mother's cancer. Being psychic and not seeing it's rough. It. That was probably to date one of the hardest things I've ever done. Why do you think that happened? Mondo, well, I believe it happened, or I should say, I think I know what happened, was to teach me a very valuable lesson about ego and about why we're here and lessons and that you're only allowed to see what you're allowed to see so that it can be assistance, you know, assist a person on their journey as well. You think something like God gave you that lesson? Absolutely. Why would he choose to give the, the death of your mother give you a lesson? Not the death of my mother, but how the death was going to be dealt with. All right. Do, so, you say it that way. Because why, I would say, why would a kind God shaped, do that? It shaped who I am. But why use your mother as an instrument? Well, let's say it was let's say it was going to happen because she was a smoker and smoked four packs of cigarettes a day, and there's some type of biological genetic issue in her found in her body that was going to create cancer. You know, now there's two options. Psychically, I can either see it and 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 know it, yeah. and either then at least have the from the standpoint of like you know, well, I saw it coming, even if I couldn't stop it. But from an ego standpoint, I'd be able to say. Well, I knew it was coming. Yes. You know, or I, I know it's coming and I see it, and therefore I, I saved her. Right. That was completely taken off the table to make me like everybody else. Yes, I have a special ability, but guess what? Just like everybody else has to deal with death, it was the quintessential lesson for me as far as it changed. My mom's passing shifted my work in its entirety. Talk to me about ballroom dancing. I love dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I love to dance. And as I yeah, that was, they got all serious and then all of a sudden they got goofy. But, <laughs> but ballroom dancing is magical to me. Is it, it is. not to you? It is. It is. I saw it my wife. Alright, now. I think this is the one where he says it. Let me see. This is the one where he says his dad's ghost pulled him out of a car. <laughs> Come on. 
<laughs> you just saying that because you're Dale Earnhardt. NASCAR is probably the only sport with the most popular. Well, the NBA is that way. With the most popular, well, I guess LeBron's not the most popular player. But the most popular player is also one of the worst. Is this a joker? He did finish third yesterday. I guess he just didn't drink enough Jack Daniels last night to make him drunk enough to lose. <clears throat> All right, so this should be the bit where he's talking about how his dad <laughs> pulled him out of his fiery car to. before the annoying commercial. <clears throat> I don't care who it's for. When you interrupt my video viewing, you can be a powerful <laughs> enemy. Especially if it's a company I don't use. And it, it, is Michael K. the worst football com or baseball commentator in the world? There's something wrong with him. Although Sterling's no walking. He thinks he's like an opera star or something. Sterling's one of the party games. Something, something wrong with that kid. Seriously. Sure, him and Seth Rogen are hanging out, aren't they? Ritz Crackers is a big one for you, yes? Junior's product endorsements add millions to his income. Forbes said he made $20 million last year, more off the track than on, but it takes a lot of money to build a NASCAR winner. This is the headquarters of Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, the facility his father built in Mooresville, North Carolina. But if you try to fast forward into the part where he's talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> All time. And his new home. It's like a... Here. Mm -hmm. uh, the front seat to his love life. I was in the... Uh, in the bathroom. Here. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether this belongs to you. Begging for dummies. Yeah. We this, all... is your, this is your handbook? Not my handbook, but it's... Uh, I, I read it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty common. <laughs> Just shut Tell up. me about you and dating. Me and dating? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I ain't no good at it, but... Uh, Why not? Well, I ain't married, am I? If I was real, real good at it, I'd probably be married by now. Let me find okay. you in the video. Look up. Right. I mean, I look forward to getting married one day, and I like being in a relationship. I like, I like having a girlfriend, but, I, you know, it seems to go for about three months yeah, and it's, it gets North to Carolina. a point to where... But the funny thing is, is that other than early in his life, he's, he's been wealthy his whole life, so... Uh, you'd think he'd get enough education to speak properly. <laughs> Hey, Brian Williams is a NASCAR fan. Explain that. What's that one uh, basketball player? Uh, uh, he owns a team. No. Oh. Wait, basketball player? Yeah. Oh, I don't know the boss Magic Johnson owns the Dodgers. Oh, yeah. It's Magic Johnson. Yeah, Magic Johnson. between Junior and his father is downright spooky. Do you think your dad was watching when you ran into trouble at Sonoma, asked Wallace? Yeah, I mean, he would have to be. I think he had a lot to do with me getting out of that car. By the way, I told you, Kim got a reading from John Edwards, too. And I'm sure his, her dad said, stop the sex tapes. And get an education. And quit acting like a twit on TV. I mean, you are a moron. I mean, you're my daughter, but you are the dumbest person I've ever seen. Anyway. I'm like the world's, one of the world's most best lawyers. Look at my daughter. I can't even add things together. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I don't know why those kids are so, I think it's Bruce Jenner's fault, why those kids are so stupid. You know? Like Paris Hilton, there's no reason for you to be that dumb. There's just no I don't life. know if that's possible you can be that stupid. There's no life experience. Yeah, that's part of it. That's, that's the issue. You know, they that's why the Cyrus is problem. What was it? Uh, Paris Hilton. 
grandfather took away like right, he's, 97 right. Yeah, but she made there. Yeah, but she made money off selling perfume to yeah, people who don't know what perfume really should be. Nice. Anyway, so here's Junior. He got into a wreck at Sonoma where the car instantly caught on fire. I'm going to show you that here in a minute. He, but he said he claimed later on, so supposedly he, he grabbed one of his PR guys by the throat after he got out of the car and said, tell me where that person was who helped me out of the car. And the guy goes, there wasn't no way to help you out. So he claims that it was his dad's ghost. He says, absolutely, I don't know how else to put it. I don't want to put some weird psycho twist on it. <laughs> like he was pulling me out or anything, but he had a lot to do with me getting out of that car from the mo movement I made to unbuckle up my belt to laying on the stretcher. I have no idea what happened, how I got out. But what does your dad have to do with it, asked Wallace. I don't have any explanation for it other than when I got into the infield care center, I had my PR man by the collar screaming at him to find a guy that pulled me out of the car, says Earnhardt Jr. He was like, nobody helped you get out. And I was like, so he talks like a valley girl. Dude, totally. <laughs> Dude, I was like, man. And then like they were like, ugh. And then they was like, oh my god. Anyway, let's go surfing, bro. That's strange because I wear... I swear somebody had me underneath my arms and was carrying me out of the car. I mean, I swear to God. So don't swear to God. And he said, and that was your dad, Wallace asked, yeah, I don't know, you tell me. It freaks me out today just talking about it. It just gives me the chill. But you said it in front of 70 million people. It freaks you out, but you didn't mind sharing that with the whole world. Here is the wreck itself. Because he's the biggest name in the NASCAR, they cut in on this speech. Dale Earnhardt sneezed. Hello, everyone. We apologize got for the interruption, or the uh, interruption to our programming. I'm Bob Varsha in our Speed Channel studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, like with a live Brady news NASCAR. update. NASCAR ass. star Dale Earnhardt Jr. suffered what we are told are minor injuries in a frightening crash and fire this morning during practice for today's American Le Mans Series Grand Prix of Sonoma so in the Dino Raceway series. in Sonoma, the California. Earnhardt was scheduled to drive in a single You're appearance in the Corvette. sports car series on this off weekend on the NASCAR Nextel Cup schedule, sharing a GTS class factory Corvette with, with road Boris racing said. veteran Boris said. Now we do have pictures from Sonoma. Second yellow car in line disappearing behind the wall. Earnhardt apparently lost traction and spun hard into the concrete with the back of the car first as it came to a stop on track. Bam. It burst into flames. Apparently, the fuel cells you see some of the from F1 to the cell were people burned alive. You see a large oh, amount of fuel on the ground from uh, the car. Here's the impact. They, they, they get killed. Oh, Watch the fuel line breaks. Oh, yeah, you, you see the fuel. Them. Watch. You'll also see a shot from inside. You just see a little bit of fire. Watch this. Apparently, dazed oh. in the impact. He was going to die. You give him, I'd say, 60 seconds that he immediately. Started Your body to get out of the car as the flagging crews brought Look, the session to now? a halt and got out the fire extinguishers. Now keep in mind, this is not a full body car like the next Hell Cup car he's used to driving in NASCAR. He's factory I know, that's There is Earnhardt being attended to by the fire crews at the back of the truck. He appeared to be dazed. His dad was right behind him. And it was decided to put him on a stretcher and airlift him to the University Hospital at the University of California at Davis. Look at that car, though. There you see what the fire did to the car, apparently totally destroyed. I should tell you if you own a Corvette and things go. Although Earnhardt was able to speak to the rescuers at the scene, he was put on a stretcher, loaded in an ambulance, and taken to the helipad at Infineon Raceway. There you see him being stabilized on the stretcher and moving around. He was put on the helicopter, taken to Davis, where it was reported that he suffered a minor injury to his knee and some minor burns. That's our latest By the time he got there, it was probably 10 million hours for him. There you see the helicopter. And in NASCAR, they don't, they're not like groupies. They call them pit lizards. <laughs> he gets pit lizards crawling all over him. I mean, they're... they're they're guys that stalk Junior. I mean, I told you he's like the Brad Pitt of NASCAR or something, or Tom Brady. Everybody wants to be next to him. It's like, that's probably why he's so drunk. Not anymore. That's, uh, that's Kevin Harvick. Anyway, so here is, here is Nancy Reagan. Listen to this. So this is the President of the United States. This is the First Lady of the United States. By the way, both of them were actors in Hollywood, so that should explain a little bit. And most people consider actors sort of be flaky people. Uh, I don't know how far I, I take that. I certainly, when I was in theater, 
the, the concept of showing up on time did not enter a single theater person's mind or doing extra work. Or, that's why I, got, I can't handle that kind of lack of respect. That's why 98% of actors fail when they go to Hollywood. They tell you in the entertainment industry, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're 15 minutes late. I would change that. If you're not 30 minutes early, you're three hours late. Theater is a demanding, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> you can't screw around with theater. Anyway, so this is Nancy Davis, who again was an actress, and the first lady of the United States, and Ronald Ray, who was the president, and obviously an actor who was in a movie with, called Bedtime for Bonzo, or he played with a chimpanzee. <laughs> Very fitting. Anyway, but he was a conservative. He actually was the head of the Screen Actors Guild. But listen to this. Though shocking, and, and think about these Christian conservatives knowing that Ronald Reagan was doing this, what would happen? Though shocking, as the title indicates, it comes out as no secret at all that the fact that the Reagan presidency was actually controlled by the cosmos, astrological forces, it is believed that the Reagans, while making very important decisions, listen to this. This would be like President Obama going, you know what, we're going to impose a tax increase because I ripped open a chicken last night and it looked favorable. <laughs> Or God told me not to vote for this bill. I mean, you start doing stuff like that, you're going to lose real quick. There actually, we had a vice presidential candidate, George McGovern's vice presidential candidate in 1972, said that he was abducted by aliens. <coughs> you can think about what happened to his candidacy. Anyway, so, and then the White House strongly relied on astrology as a savior. Joan Quigley, who was the planner of almost all presidential travel, press conferences, including the Reagan cancer surgery, was an astrologer and based the surgery on astrology. It is believed that one signing of a treaty between the U.S. and the Soviet, I should say Soviet Union, to eliminate medium-range nuclear missiles was signed on astrological advice. I'm sure the Russians really appreciate that. Why you bring witch lady to a negotiation? <laughs> I do nothing in front of this woman. Get her out of here. No astrology. And this is why we don't trust the West. Anyway. Anyway. The treaty was signed on December 8, 1987 at 1.30 p.m. When Reagan was the governor of California, he signed uh, legislation that allowed licensed astrologers to practice their trade and, re and remove them from the category of being fortune tellers. It's actually still against the law in New York to be a fortune teller, although you can get around it by saying you're a palmist or something like that. In this case, there is one astrologer who became very famous just because of predicting the assassination of President Kennedy. I could have predicted that, that somebody's disgruntled husband would shoot this moron in the head. I mean, he slept with everybody's wife. He slept, he did, Kennedy did this sleep with strange, just so nobody's wives. He slept with, like, the Secretary of State's wife and the head of the Senate. He was sleeping with powerful people's wives. And when you do that kind of stuff, you get the, the little laser sight when you go home at night. It starts to appear on your head and things like that, okay? I'm still not completely convinced that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't kill him because he slept with Lee Harvey Oswald's wife. Okay? The president sleeps with my wife, he's going to be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Just like when Jerry Seinfeld, like, he, 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 some woman went on her honeymoon and then he met this woman at a, 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 an exercise club and started flirting with her and then she left her husband, her newlywed husband, for Jerry Seinfeld. And if that would have happened to me, I'd be, from here on out, known as the man who killed Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> He'd be dead in a door or burn his house down. You don't steal my newlywed wife. What's wrong with you? And shame on her, too. What kind of a dumbass does that? <laughs> By predicting that Reagan would become governor of California in 62, that was Gene Dixon who predicted Kennedy. That's like predicting an earthquake in California, and it's a real hard one. I don't need to be Nostradamus to know that people in New Orleans don't know what they're doing when you build a city below sea level. Anyway. Dixon gained Reagan's favor, but of which was later dropped by Nancy when she predicted that the husband Reagan would not win the presidential elections, which he didn't in 76. Uh, jo Joyce Gilson was another astrologer who helped the Reagans in selecting the vice president, which was H.W. Bush. Okay? And he, he, had he not got it. So, so thanks a lot, psychic. If you don't like George W. Bush, thanks a lot, psychic, for picking his father as the vice presidential candidate. By the way, the story was that Bush was a Freemason and Reagan wasn't, and the Freemasons tried to kill Reagan so they could kick Bush into office. I don't know if that's true or not. You want to talk about a cult? Anyway, so they picked George Bush was the best candidate. I love this book. They think the last name is uh, lowercase. Jill, 
Jilson could offer, the best candidate Jilson could offer, to her it was because Bush was a Gemini, of which was the best or rather the most compatible sign in Gemini that rhymed with Reagan, who was an Aquarian. Could you imagine if Mitt Romney comes out and says, you know what, I rolled some runes or some dice, and I'm going to pick Marco Rubio, that's my vice president, or Sarah Payton. I mean, you're going to lose every bit of credit. You're going to lose credibility anyway if you talk about Sarah Payton. Anyway. So, um, anyway, listen to this, though. In 1980, when Reagan commenced his campaign, quickly predicted his succession to the presidents of the White House. Presidency, this is really badly written. But everything changed when there was an assassination attempt. This was less than two months after he was in office. You take the presidency the next year in 81. Anyway, this is because Nancy came to learn that March 30th would be a terrible day for Reagan, Nancy... Learn all this from Quigley. At this point, Quigley was appointed to astrologer, astrological protector for Reagan's life. <laughs> Obama needs one of these people. Anyway, from being a casual astrologer friend, interestingly about this assassination is that Reagan had a deathbed vision while in the hospital. This is when Nancy Reagan also became aware of the so-called presidential death cycle, of which it involves Jupiter and Saturn, but also known as the zero-year curse. That is because each and every president elected at the same time since the election of William Harrison has died while in office, except for one. Guess who? George W. Bush. He's the only one that was elected during a zero-zero year, like, or, or a zero-year, like 80 or whatever, 60, that somebody didn't try to... Well, maybe they did. Remember when he choked on the pretzel? Man, they should put that pretzel in the Smithsonian. <laughs> and by the way, you know what the weirdest part about that was? Not that he almost died choking on a pretzel, but that he was alone watching the Super Bowl. The President of the United States was by himself watching the most watched event with other people in the Super Bowl. By himself. And the only reason why he didn't die is because the Secret Service heard he hit his head on the couch. Okay? So his solitude almost did him in, because there was no way he could have been the Heimlich maneuver. No, it wouldn't be, because then yeah, guess who would be the president? Dick Cheney. Yeah, that's not bad. I'd rather have Satan run this country. I mean, at least Satan's got boundaries. You know, my gosh. Even, Satan's like, man, Dick, you, you're out of control, dude. I mean, something wrong with you, okay? Anyway, I'll send you to heaven, just get rid of you. This is when Nancy Reagan also, blah, blah. Harrison died. Harry Truman being a common man with principles, he, may, he maintained of which we can actually see the same on Reagan. Harry being a Baptist, the Reagans were into psychics in the Presbyterian Church of America. It's always good to be in the Presbyterianism and psychics. I'm sure that goes together. Like peanut butter and tar or something. I mean, come on. Though Reagan opened the diplomatic relationship with the Vatican for the first time and managed to put Rome and the USA on equal international ground, Harry signed the Vatican guest book as Harry S. Truman Baptist. I'm sure that made people happy. To learn more about psychics, blah, blah, blah. I love this. They give you a free psychic reading and all that other stuff. <laughs> so what does this point out? That psychic and psychic beliefs are much more prominent than the rational world would allow to occur. And really what it is on some levels is a throwback to the things of the past. When, like for example, when the Black Plague came through, what did they say was the cause of it? Huh? No, no, no. That's what they found out eventually. Oh. Right, the church said it was, it was, yeah, it was sinners and prostitutes and all these people. At one point, and this should show you how far back anti-Semitism goes. In, in Freiburg, Germany, way before Hitler in the 12th, in the 13, 1400s, they forced Jewish people to sign a confession that said they poisoned the wells. They blamed it on Jewish people, and then for a while they blamed it on cats. And so they killed all the cats. And guess what happened to the plague when they killed the cats? You know what's interesting? You know how this, the Salem witch trial was about they took these single women that were living out in the outskirts and they thought they were threats to the patri patriarchal order? The women who lived on the outskirts of that town that were like widowers, or widow widows, they had a lot of cats and, no, and everybody thought they were sort of like witches. And so they left them alone and those people had like a 50% less mortality rate during the plague than these other people. And I'll tell you right now, and, and one of the reasons why... People thought witches. Well, people thought cats were witches. They thought they were demons. They thought they spread evil spirits. You know, cats got some weird eyes, and they run in the room like they saw a ghost. Like a lot of you know, cats are cats are goofy. They look like they're on acid. <laughs> their eyes get all weird, and if you just feel like this, they're like this. And then for the next 20 minutes, their eyes are like lit up, like they're on fire or something. But uh, but look at it. Uh, ask any farmer. Can you have a farm without cats? You can have one, but it's going to be a rat farm. That's what it's going to be. Because rats love barns and things like that. Okay. 
So anyway, so you see the superstition slowly being pulled away and being replaced by rational thought, but still to this day, people won't walk under ladders, people will get scared when black cats go across the path, people will walk on cracks on the sidewalk, all this throw salt over the shoulder, they won't go outside, now, we got Friday the 13th coming up, people won't go outside that day, I'm serious, people take this stuff serious. I've heard even some people when they try to sell their house, they bury the seat upside down in their yard. The what? There's a saint. Does anyone, what saint is it? Saint Antonin or something? I swear, I'm not kidding you. you can't, I wouldn't make that up, you know? Anyway, all right, everybody. Anybody have any questions? Make sure to 